Hello everybody, this video is an in-depth overview of the patent infringement lawsuit going on between Healthier Choices Management Corporation and RJ Reynolds Vapor Company. The video is meant to be a first step introduction to the case for you, not a cover-all for every possibility that could happen. You should watch this one first though, and then look for updates on the channel about each step that's happening in the process. It's very possible that something has already happened in the case, like a filing or a ruling that may change the status of the things that I'm talking about here. My goal is to educate you all on the base information that you need to know to be able to follow the case and see what's happening as it moves forward and then stay informed as new updates because things build on each other as the case progresses. But so you can skip this video if you already know the basics or feel comfortable with uh, what the case is about. You can also use the timestamps in the description below to skip to a section you wanna learn more about and there is a quick summary at the end. All right, this one's packed full of more information than you could ever want to know about HCMC versus RJ Reynolds, so buckle up and let's get started. Now, before I get into the nitty details of the case, let's talk about some really important logistical stuff that you need to know. The parties here are Healthier Choices Management Corporation, so an RJ Reynolds Vapor Company. I'll refer to them as we have with HCMC, and this will be RJ Reynolds. But it's important to know that RJ Reynolds Vapor Company is a very specific subsidiary of British American Tobacco, or BAT. That's the stock symbol that you would look up for the overall parent company, BAT. BAT owns RJ Reynolds, so that's the relationship there. But the parties in the case, it's HCMC suing that specific entity, RJ Reynolds Vapor Company, here in the United States. Now, Philip Morris, that other giant tobacco company, which is also being sued by HCMC, it's a totally separate company. They're not related at all. Philip Morris is the biggest tobacco company in the world, and obviously the United States, and BAT is right there fighting for number two in the market share, uh, but it certainly is the second biggest tobacco company in the US. So HCMC essentially has litigation now against the two biggest tobacco companies in the US and all, arguably the world. That's giant piles of money that's being made every year on various products, vaping, smoking, cigarettes, everything in between. And HCMC in both of these lawsuits, they're trying to get a piece of that pile of money from each company. The lawsuit here is a federal lawsuit, meaning that we're in the federal U.S. court system using federal court rules, and the case is about federal patent law. HCMC filed the case in the federal court located in North Carolina, which is because that's the state where R.J. Reynolds is incorporated in the U.S. You might have heard of Winston Cigarettes. Well, that's an R.J. Reynolds brand that's named after where the company started, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So when you file a federal lawsuit, there's a whole bunch of different rules and restraints that apply where you can actually file the suit, like which court you go to. But most often you sue the person or the company that you're suing in the state where they do business or where they're incorporated. Every state has one or more federal court branches, which are called district courts. In North Carolina, there's the Eastern District, the Middle District, and the Western District. And it's basically geographical regions, right? This lawsuit's in the Middle Middle District of North Carolina. So when you're looking up the case or the court rules or the judges or anything else about the case or the courts, make sure you're looking at the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of North Carolina. It's right there at the top of all the documents in the caption, all the documents that get filed. Again, this is federal court, not state court. So we only really care about the federal rules, federal laws, and the federal judicial system like the appeals process and all that. And that's the Middle District of North Carolina Federal Court. The judge who's been assigned to this case is Judge William Osteen Jr. He was appointed in 2007 by President G.W. Bush. He's been there a long time, right? 2007 is nearly 20 years, right? So he's a very experienced judge. I don't really know much about how he's treated patent cases in particular or anything like that with that judicial history, but honestly, it's not really that relevant. What matters more is that the legal precedent that HCMC and RJ Reynolds are going to rely on to make their cases, make their arguments, uh, we, that's that's what's important because uh, we look at the past rulings and how the court has handled similar cases in the past that HCMC and RJ Reynolds bring to the court, right? Usually judges take each case uniquely and rely on the parties to bring their arguments to them. They need the past rulings to help their stances on things like admitting evidence, getting past some motions like the motion to dismiss that already exists, and other events in the case process. And we'll talk more about that as they happen down the line. Now, keep in mind that the court location and this judge are completely different 
from the Philip Morris case. That Philip Morris case is in Georgia federal court. They have a Georgia federal district court judge. The Georgia federal court and the North Carolina federal court, they don't talk to each other. They don't have anything to do with each other other than they're part of the federal system. And they're completely uh, different lawsuits that are happening here. Two completely different lawsuits. The two courts probably follow separate legal precedents based on what rulings have been made in the Georgia federal district court and in the North Carolina district courts. And there are actually uh, possibly different appeals courts that apply to it because there's a circuit and there's a different region that covers these two states, these two courts. So the it's possible that we're looking at two, not only two different, totally different cases, but the law that applies could be slightly different in each case as well. So we can't assume what happens in Georgia is going to happen the same way in North Carolina and vice versa. They are totally different entities within the federal court system. And outside of using any Supreme Court cases or any major, major appeals court cases, we're mostly going to be looking at the cases that have been ruled on by those particular federal courts. Okay, so we have to look at them separately. Now, one question I know many of you are going to ask is who are the attorneys for HCMC? Is it still Cozen, o- uh, Cozen O'Connor? And yes, it's still the same law firm that's been working on the Philip Morris lawsuit and everything related to HCMC on the patent review cases. They're here again, too. Same same firm. The difference here between this and the Philip Morris case is the Philip Morris case has a team of Georgia attorneys because you have to be barred in the state that you're working in uh, on a case. You have to have someone there that's kind of the sponsor of the case in that state. And this case in North Carolina with R.J. Reynolds, they've got a North Carolina uh, barred team of attorneys. So uh, essentially, same people running the show. It's Cozen O'Connor running it on the higher level, the strategy and things, working with the client, HCMC. But there's essentially different boots on the ground. You've got a North Carolina team of people who work in North Carolina who have worked with, probably worked with this judge or worked with this court case before. Um, you know, so that's it's that's normal. That's just what you have to do. Um, you can have the overarching strategy by a, a firm like Cozen O'Connor, but you have to have people who are barred in that state to work in that federal court. On the other side, R.J. Reynolds is represented by attorneys at Jones Day, which is a huge, huge global firm. They're massive. Big companies have big law firms all the time. No surprise there. So quick summary so far. A lot of logistics going on. HCMC suing R.J. Reynolds in U.S. federal court in the Middle District of North Carolina with Judge Osteen presiding over the case. Cozen O'Connor is primarily representing HCMC and Jones Day is representing R.J. Reynolds. All right. Now, with all that logistical, that prefacing information down packed here, there'll be a test at the end. No, I'm just kidding. But now we've got all that down, let's look at the actual details of the case. So the case is actually pretty simple at this point in time when this video is being made. HCMC is claiming that R.J. Reynolds is violating one of HCMC's patents by making, importing, and selling a series of vaping pens and liquid pods. So HCMC has an electronic cigarette patent. That's U.S. patent number 9538788. You can see it right there on the screen there. You can Google that number, U.S. patent 9538788. And that will let you view the patent and its history on Google Patents. Everything you need to know as a layman, as someone who's not uh, a patent inclined person like me, like, you know, I mean, you know, you and I are in the same boat here. We don't really know much about this um, from the scientific standpoint. Everything you need to know will be on that site. But keep in mind that this patent is not the same patent as the one involved in the Philip Morris case. This is a totally separate patent. It's active and it's registered to HCMC and not set to expire until 2034. There is no patent review currently at the making of this video on March 10th, 2024, that there's no review case on it. So the patent office has not been petitioned to review it like they did in Philip Morris case. Uh, It's a free and clear and active valid patent as of right now. Now that doesn't mean it can't happen that way in the future that RJ Reynolds wouldn't petition the patent office to do that but we'll have to see what happens on the road. But as of March 10th, 2024, when I'm making this video, there's nothing on the patent. Uh, It is an active patent, no review in process. So it's valid as of today. Now, as I said earlier, make sure to stay with the channel to see updates, uh, as this is supposed to be the kind of the first introduction to the case. It's your your logistical 101 on the case, and it's not a cover-all for every possibility, so you want to watch this first and then look for updates. So there could be a patent review down the road. There could be other things related to the patent in the patent office. You have to check on those videos. You can also look at the public record site for the patent office to see if anything has been filed. You can do this yourself. All you have to do is super simple, is you go to the website that you see here on the screen. It's also in the video description below. 
and you search for the patent numbers and the identifiers field on that site. So you'll select the patent number from the drop down menu there on that site and enter just the patent number, no commas or anything, 9538788, and then you hit apply. And if you get no results, that means that nothing's been filed. There's no review happening and nothing in the patent office is going yet with that patent. That's what you want to see as an HTMC supporter, that there's nothing going on with the patent there. So you can check that in the public records. Again, that website is in the video description below. You just put in the patent number and you can search for it. All right, back to the case. HCMC is claiming that RJ Reynolds is violating their electronic cigarette patent by making and selling its line of Views Alto vape pens and the Views Alto pre-filled liquid vaping pods. That's the pen itself and then all the little juice pods that go into it for the flavoring. Now HCMC's complaint, that's the document that is filed to initiate the lawsuit, complaint, it says very little. It's pretty much a standard bare bones complaint, much smaller with less detail than the one they filed against Philip Morris. Remember that one had some issues because they put too much into it essentially. The complaint in essence just says, hey, we've got a valid patent. Uh, looks like it covers the mechanics of what's in that Views Alto pen and the, the pods. So we should get the money for everything they've sold, a portion of what they've sold over the years and in the future. The complaint has a few pictures of how those devices are marketed to the public and the patent is attached to the complaint. But other than that, there really aren't many details to explain how the Views Alto uh, actually infringes on the patent. That might not be necessary, though, to show that because complaints, you just have to state a claim uh, on which you're going to prove later. Uh, that's what the whole process of the, of, the, of the discovery and the trial is supposed to. That's when you prove out your claim. Uh, it's not clear yet if, if if they put enough into it and that's a focus area that rj reynolds has has tackled already with the motion to dismiss that's currently being considered again it's march 10th when i'm making this but we have to see down the road what's happened but hmc did pretty much uh the bare bones requirement on this one which may or may not be enough um and again we'll talk about that with a motion to dismiss so um R.J. Reynolds was claiming that the complaint's missing important details to make the connection between the patent and the Views Alto, but it's also very possible that that was enough in the complaint and it'll just move forward. So again, check out the video about the motion to dismiss that's coming out with this. Um, and again, it's only March 10th here. So, you know, you could be watching this in October or even in 2025 and things have been a lot different. So keep in mind with that. But HCMC, for the most part, has done what it needed to do, right, to start the lawsuit. They've made their claim that they have a valid patent, that uh, which is true, right? We can see on the web, on the patent office website, on Google Patents, we can see that it's an active patent, and they've stated that um, the Views Alto is an infringing product. That's all we got for the complaint, though. Nothing really else at all. No other evidence or any other arguments. But more details will obviously come as the case progresses, uh, and then... We, uh, we see kind of what, what the arguments are going to be, the scientific aspect of it and all that sort of thing. But that's the case, really. It's a patent infringement. They're trying to get money based on the sales, past and future, of the Views Alto and those pods um, because all RJ Reynolds has uh, allegedly been using uh, uh, HMC's patent without permission. It's a very standard patent infringement lawsuit. We, same, same idea as Philip Morris. Um, and many other patent infringement lawsuits where we have a patent and we're saying that this device or this this thing that's being sold and making money in the U.S. actually is part of that patent. It's covered by the patent. One last important thing here about the case before we move on to other things is that HCMC requested a jury trial so that if the case goes to trial, it will be determined by a jury of regular folks like us, not the judge. Right. The judge will oversee the trial, but there will be a jury because HTMC as the plaintiff has asked for it. And you can tell because right on the complaint at the top in the caption, it says demand for jury trial. This is the plaintiff's right to ask for that. It will be a jury trial if it makes it to trial. All right, so now we know what the case is about. Again, very little details at this stage. Keep hanging out, we'll follow more as HCMC has to go to hearings or fight motions or do anything else to make those arguments. So what's in it for HCMC? What's the outcome here? What's the, what's the goal for HCMC? Well, with most patent infringement lawsuits that we've seen, um, the plaintiff's trying to get money based on the sales of the infringing product, right? They're trying to get royalties on future pay future sales. They're trying to get a portion of past sales, um, basically anything related to use of the technology that's patented. They want to get a piece of that uh, piece of that pie. HCMC states in their complaint that they want compensation for using the patent and a continuing royalty for any post-trial infringing sales. So they want 
pretty common stuff for this kind of thing. It's their same request they made against Philip Morris. In that case, they want a piece of the money pile that's being made. But how much is that money pile? Well, that's for the jury to determine. The Views Alto product is RJ Reynolds' main vaping product in the US. So we're talking a pretty big amount of sales. Remember that this is a US patent case though. So we only care about the sales that take place here in the United States or any sales that result from the manufacturing of a device or, or the pods here in the state. So it has to be made here or sold here to apply for this patent. We don't care about what happens overseas. Those are patent cases for if HCMC has a patent in a different country, right? Each country has its own um, patent system. We only care about the US. All right, however, one threat to this or one, one issue to, to keep in mind is sales have declined a little bit over the last year or so uh, because of the FDA rejecting and banning some of the flavors of those pods. Uh, berry and menthol and a couple other things have been rejected and the FDA is taking kind of a consistent stance against flavored vaping pods and liquids, um, mostly to combat youth use of vaping. You see a lot of commercials saying, you know, we'll stop vaping for kids and keeping it away from uh, teenagers and, and that sort of thing. So that could have some impact on sales, but I mean, a lot of sales have already happened, right? So there already is that, and you know, vaping's just not going to go away, right? There's plenty of adults who do that. And there's no signs that RJ Reynolds is just going to stop making and selling the, the views Alto. So, you know, it's not that huge of a threat. It's just something that's the trend could go down with future sales, but it's, it's still, you know, it's still a, a giant, giant billion dollar industry. So HCMC is after a portion of all the sales that have already been done and future sales. So I, again, I don't know how much that is. The jury will have to figure it out, but easily there's the potential here for tens of millions, maybe more. Um, the vaping market just in 2023, based on a little research I did, was over $8 billion in sales. And the Views Alto is about 30% of the market share. So that's two, almost two and a half billion dollars in sales from the Views Alto just in 2023, right? Um, so you know, going after a piece of that, you can you can do the math. But HCMC has to win the case or get a settlement for any of that to matter, right? If they lose the case, they get nothing. But uh, so don't get too excited. But you know, there is a lot a potential for a lot of money here, just like the Philip Morris case, right? There there is a huge pile of money to go after if HCMC can prove that the views Alto it includes what they have patented, right? That's the same concept with the Philip Morris case and why that's been such an interesting case to follow. There is a potential for a very high ceiling to be very profitable if they can win. All right, so now we know what the lawsuit's about, what they're trying to, what HCMC is trying to get out of it, uh, some potential there. But what's the process? What's gonna happen next? What's, what happens in, the, in as we move forward? So here's a super fast overview of the legal process for a patent case like this. And if you've been following the Philip Morris case, you've heard a lot of this over and over and over again, but. I, I'm trying to oversimplify this again to people who are not so legal minded or don't have the legal background like I do. Um, so if you're a lawyer out there, just relax. I, I'm skipping stuff on purpose, glossing over some things, trying trying to make it digestible for the most shareholders, right? Or most people who are interested in the case. So we have the complaint. The lawsuit has started. RJ Reynolds, as the defendant, has to respond to it. They chose to respond by filing a motion to dismiss. Again, it's March 10th. We know that there's a motion to dismiss out there being considered by the judge. Another video will we'll cover that. But that's the same thing that happened in the Philip Morris case, right? They'll fight over the motion. And if the case is allowed to continue, if, if the judge rejects the motion to dismiss, then RJ Reynolds has to file what's called an answer, which is where they admit or deny each line of the complaint. And then they set up their defenses. So during this early phase, we might also see RJ Reynolds run to the patent office. They may do the same thing Philip Morris did, try to get the patent invalidated, right? That's also very common. Um, unfortunate effect of that, just like Philip Morris, is that would delay the lawsuit until that's fixed, right? Right now we have Philip Morris being delayed, uh, again, March 10th. Uh, it's being delayed waiting for appeals and all sorts of stuff because of the patent office. That same thing could happen here, or maybe it won't. Um, but uh, RJ Reynolds... Uh, Adam and Philip Morris both love to run to the post, the post office, run to the patent office to uh, to try to get things validated and thrown out before they even go to court. So um, I, it would not be a surprise to see that happen. That's why I say, you know, like I said earlier, go to the PTAB site, you know, refresh that once a week. Probably I'll be doing that, too. I would expect to see something, especially if the motion to dismiss is denied. You probably will see that. I'll see some review attempt. All right. But assuming things move forward, um, you know, whether there's a patent review or not, uh, RJ Reynolds will file their answer. 
Then they moved to a series of hearings and conferences with the judge to discuss kind of how the process is going to work. So they'll set a preliminary trial date. They'll kind of know when the trial is going to be. That always gets delayed for the most part. But the outline of discovery and all the other rules and constraints and agreements that they're going to have to kind of rule the process. There will also be what's called a claim construction hearing. That's a big part of what we talked about in the Philip Morris case uh, where the combustion issue has, has come up. But claims construction is when the parties get together and advocate to the judge how the patent should be read. So that instead of going to trial and trying to get a jury to understand the definition of X and Y and arguing what a definition should be and having two parties disagree on what a definition should be, they're going to define everything from the patent right from the beginning. Um, so that's what claim construction, how to read the patent, basically, how, how to construe, how to construct the claims that are made in the patent. So not sure what the hot topics are going to be in this case with that. You know, if it's combustion or not, I don't know, but we'll see what it's going to be. Um, but that all that high end science will be determined before they even go to discovery, before they even figure out what they're fighting over, basically. So the trial gets to be focused on the facts of proving that a product or a patent fits the definitions instead of arguing over what the definitions are, because the claims construction hearing does that uh, in advance. It's kind of an even playing field for arguments. So after all that, I've got some conferences for, for logistics and there's some settlement attempts. Maybe there's a settlement. Maybe there's not. A lot of cases don't settle this early, um, but they have all that in the claims construction and then discovery starts. Discovery can take six months, a year, two years, three years, whatever. It's 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 an uh, amorphous, unknown amount of time, depending on what crazy stuff happens during, and what how extensive the, the situation is. Um, but that's when the parties work to get uh, witnesses that they interview, do depositions, which is the on record uh, interviews basically they send questions do evidence gathering and request for uh, materials or documents all, all sorts of stuff right they're trying to understand the other side's uh, situation and their arguments uh, there's lots of motions that happen about trying to get evidence kicked out or if parties are delaying and there's some other stuff happening uh, attempts to just in the in the um, the case altogether happen you know lots of things happen in there a lot of variants it's hard to say what, what could or couldn't happen. Um, if we get to discovery, when we get to discovery, I'll be able to explain and talk about all that. So that takes a long time. Again, motions and everything will delay the heck out of it. After discovery, then there's another attempt at settlement. That's when most cases settle. So if we get to settlement conference after discovery, it's a high chance that there could be a settlement because everybody's seen all the sides, all the evidence everybody has. They're able to say kind of what they think their chances are at trial. Right. Sometimes they keep going if they think if they can't reach a settlement or if one group thinks they're going to have a better outcome if they go to trial. Again, that's way far ahead from now. Um, but that's often where cases settle. Um, but if there is not a settlement, then it'll lead to trial and dates get all delayed all the time. You know, even if we see that a trial is going to be on X and Y date, I wouldn't count on it. Right. Because things get delayed for all that. Um, so things just take a long time. But let's say it goes to trial and HCMC wins. R.J. Reynolds can then try to appeal the ruling to the Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, or basically they can appeal any decision they didn't like that happened. Let's say the judge allowed some evidence that they didn't think should have been, or they agreed with something that they, they think is against the, the precedence of law. Um, well, they can appeal that, the whole thing, uh, or the result of the trial to the Federal Appeals Court. Um, so we get another year or so there with an appeal that could end with it coming back to the court for another trial or overturn something, you know, so that could that could start the process again. There could be another appeal after that. Right. So you could have, you know, a two to three year process just to go to trial, another year and a half appeal, another year or two for another discovery and trial period, another appeal. I mean, it could be five to ten years before a trial, before a case gets uh, gets fixed or in a couple of months, they just decide to settle. Right. I can't tell you what's more likely, what's not. We can only just see what happens. I'm not in the room. I'm, you know, I'm not part of any of this. <laughs> I'm just here as kind of an educator, uh, as an observer. So I can't possibly know or tell you when this is going to happen, when this is going to end. Right. Like the Philip Morris case. Right. It looked like it was going quickly. And then, boom, we've been waiting two years and nothing's really happened. So it's really hard to tell. I don't tell say this to scare you away from this or to. I'm just uh, to do anything other than just set your standards and your expectations kind of flatline where, look, this is going to take a long time. You need to be patient if you're following this, if you're if you're making investments related to this case. It's not like tomorrow they're going to settle and you're going to make a bunch of money. It's it's 
it's going to take a long time. And again, there is a lot of money potential for both of these cases, Philip Morris and the RJ Reynolds cases. They've sold a lot of these products. So if HCMC can win, there is a lot of a lot of money on the line. OK, just to be realistic, I mean, look at the market, the market uh, um, structures of how much how many sales they've had in the last couple of years with these things and in the future. Right. Vaping's not going away. So these things all take time. Right. And I just want to advise you to kind of be patient about it. Right. Um, and don't don't expect much. Right. Until it happens. So because anything can happen. Now that you know what the case is about, what the process could look like, what, what's at stake, other important things, let's look at how you can follow it and do your own research um, along with me. Okay, of course, one way you just hang out in the Discord. We've got the Shark Invested Waters Discord server. The link is in the video description below. Uh, if you've you know just come out there, we, I post all the documents I find, all the you know the complaints there, the motion to dismiss there, any other documents that get filed, I grab, I pay for them, grab them off of the the docket, and put them in there in Discord for you. Um, so definitely join that if you want to follow along or talk with some other folks who are following the case. Um, you can also, I also post updates on Twitter. And yes, it's Twitter. I'm not calling it the other name. It's Twitter. It will always be Twitter to me. Um, you can follow me at, at Shark Invested if you aren't following me already. Uh, and then, of course, I'll be making videos as things pop up. Um, you know, usually is a time to make trying to make them as timely as possible. It takes me time for me to read and acquire the documents as well. Um, but I, I'll be certainly making videos as things happen that I can educate you guys on what's going on. But if you want to do the research yourself, and it can be a little tricky to get access to documents without being a lawyer, um, at least for free, um, Pacer Monitor is the best place, pacermonitor.com. Um, you can look at the federal court document docket, and you can get a few free checks. You can see some stuff. You can see what appears on the docket usually, um, sometimes with a day or two delay, though. Um, but you can pay for a membership on there. It's like 20 or 30 bucks a month, I think. Um, per, or, or there's like a per document um, it kind of depends on what, what you want to do with it, but you can buy the documents through Pacer Monitor as well. Um, what you need to do is when you search for the case, you'll want to use the case number, which is right at the top of every court filing in that cap the top part. Um, that case number you see is 1 uh, colon 23 dash CV dash 813. That's the one there at the top of the caption on the document. Uh, make sure you're looking for the Middle District of North Carolina in federal court. And we've got Judge Osteen for the for the for the case that's federal court not state courts you're not going to find anything related to this case looking at north carolina state courts you have to be looking at federal courts okay that was a ton of information all right so let's do a quick summary to make sure we're all on the same page here we got hcmc healthier choices management corporation suing rj reynolds vapor company that's rj reynolds we're going to keep referring to that they're a subsidiary of british american tobacco bat bat is the stock um symbol if you want to check out their their parent company patent infringement federal lawsuit in the middle district of north carolina under the federal judge william osteen we're looking at federal patent law here under federal court rules nothing related to state no state law state court anything hcmc claims that rj reynolds is violating hcmc's patent by selling the views alto vaping pen and the liquid pods for the device and that makes up about 30 percent of the vaping market in the united states HCMC wants money from those sales and royalties from future sales. It's going to be a long road ahead with a lot of possibilities and pitfalls for HCMC. And it's hard to forecast what's going to happen because every case is unique. But that's it for now, right? You can find a ton of information and references and the articles I use down in the description below. Uh, stay tuned to the channel. I'll post videos as soon as I can with updates. Um, Again, March 10th here when I'm making this. This video is meant to be your kind of one-on-one intro to the case. And then I need you to look at the other videos to get updates. It, the case builds on itself. So knowing the past information is going to be really helpful in understanding future events. Well, I really appreciate you all being on this ride with me, going for another <laughs> another chase here, looking at another long court case um, with HCMC. I look forward to sharing all the education I can with the legal process and all the filings, all the documents, everything in the case. Remember to join us in the Discord using the link below in the description if you want to hang out with other people who are following the case or I'll be there and I post documents and all that. But in the meantime, you know, be careful about how you're trading, make informed financial decisions, be patient, and be safe. All right, we'll see you all next time. Thanks and bye.